بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد so welcome to the second session of our bukhari sahih bukhari class of kitab al iman so we begin with brother nadim reading um hadith number 1 of the book tafaddal ready hadathna ubaidullah ibn musa qala akhbarna hanzala ibn abi sufyan an ikrima ibn khalid an ibn umar radiyallahu an qala qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bunya al islam ala khams shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadar rasulullah wa iqam as salah wa ita'i az zakah wal hajj wa sawm ramadan good jazakallah khair so the first hadith begins by saying hadathana So this is the very first hadith of the chapter. So when, how do you know the primary corpus, the asl of the book uh, begins when you see words like haddathana. Um, in the prints that you have, they make it easier. They put a number, they put a, they make it bold, but um, it doesn't have to be like that. And some of the manuscripts don't have that, but you need to understand the primary versus the secondary corpus. Last week, we... covered the primary cor- uh, this tarjumatul bab so he has babul iman wa qawli nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam buni al islam ala khams the chapter is called al iman and the statement of the prophet that islam is built upon five and he begins with a preamble sharing various verses and athar uh, from various companions and early muslims that show you um, different aspects of iman and we had a long discussion on iman Now the very first hadith is this one hadathana ubaidullah ibn musa Now prior to the hadith I mentioned towards the end it says bab du'akum imanukum so that is likely a mistake uh going to Imam Nawawi and Sheikh Akram also it doesn't fit here so this hadith is part of that chapter so this is the first hadith of that chapter which chapter bab al iman wa qawli nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam buniyal islam ala khams because this hadith is buniyal islam ala khams So fits with that. Doesn't make sense to have another chapter here, du'aukum imanukum, and we talked about that last week. So I mentioned last week, and before I begin, let me. Tahir's not here, so I can turn this off. Okay. So the very first. Hadith begins with his teacher. So, uh, when we study Sahih Bukhari, it's, it's very useful to to look at each teacher and discuss his life and spend more time there. As you go higher up in the isnad towards the companions, then we don't need to discuss the companions because everyone um, or people are just people understand who Ibn Omar was and Ibn Abbas, and and it's something that's easily accessible. So it's not useful in a class to discuss, you know, even the companions. So we'll we won't do biographies of the companions, but at least the first name is very important, the uh, teacher of Imam al-Bukhari and then some of the names higher up. So I mentioned Ubaidullah ibn Musa. So he was a problematic figure for some. And I, what did I say about him last week at the end of the class? He was Shia, yes. So Now in the previous semester we did talk about him when I mentioned the unlikely teachers of Bukhari he was the first one we talked about so his name was Ubaidullah ibn Musa and I you know Azim is not here but like this is my name everyone who has the name Ubaidullah is a problematic person unfortunately in history generally that's the case so Ubaidullah ibn Musa his name was Uh, or his full lineage was Ubaidullah ibn Musa ibn Abi al-Mukhtar Badham and his kunya was Abu Muhammad so he was a hadith expert of Kufa he was born in the year 128 and he died in the year 212 or 214 so he was a hadith expert and he was an honest person with strong memory not known to lie but also he belong uh, he was part of you probably couldn't call it a sect at this point but it was part of the you know the group that called themselves shia uh, they were the people of ahl al-bayt so abu daud for instance 
calls, he says about him, كَانَ مُحْتَرِقًا شِيَعِيًّا He was a burning Shia. So he's not just like one of those that's inclining towards that. He was part and parcel of, of whatever they were at that time. But even Abu Dawood accepted his hadith and related from him. So basically all major hadith scholars took from him, except for one. Who do you think did not take hadith from him at all? Ibn Abu? Ahmed? Yeah, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And Muslim is a good guess, but a Muslim actually did take his hadith. Like, Muslim did not, generally his approach was when someone had questionable beliefs or part of questionable groupings, um, Muslim was much more careful, he would reject their hadith. But Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal is the only one who clearly rejected him. Everyone else held him to be reliable. Abu Hatim al-Razi, all the experts of hadith, uh, they took from him. So despite his status of being Shia, he earned praise from many people and he did, um, he was accepted as a narrator by many, many people, uh, including Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Dawood and, and, and others. So Yahya ibn Ma'in said about him that he is reliable, so you should write his hadith. Now Yahya ibn Ma'in is a famous friend of Imam Ahmad, right? So. Imam Ahmad and Yahya ibn Ma'in had a long back and forth. So Imam Ahmad wrote a strongly worded letter to Yahya rebuking him for taking the narrations of Ubaidullah bin Musa. How can you do that when he is such and such? And then Yahya wrote a letter back saying, how can you take from Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani, the great muhaddith of Yemen, who also had Shiri tendency, but he says we both know in his letters, so Yahya's letter, he said we both know that um, the way he criticized Uthman was much more serious than Ubaidullah criticizing of Muawiyah. So that's much more serious by a hundred times. So, you know, so this, what does that show you? It shows you a lot of things. One that, you know, this idea of accepting narrators, it's, it is subjective to some point. Knowledge is subjective. It's not science. It's not like, uh, you know, mathematics where there's only one way. It is subjective. These are great experts, and sometimes they differed over things. But in the matter of Ubaidullah bin Musa, most of them, or almost all of them, accepted his hadith, except Imam Ahmad. So Bukhari generally, and we're studying Bukhari, so we can talk about him uh, more than others. His methodology is this. He does not want to miss the truth. He does not want to deprive you of sound knowledge just because of someone's some problems with a person, or even someone's beliefs, for instance. So now, this does not mean that when Bukhari accepts Ubaidullah bin Musa, or any other narrator, doesn't mean every single thing coming from that person is right. It just means he takes the good and leaves the bad. And even in reports, he's not taking all the reports of Ubaidullah bin Musa. He's narrating a handful of reports from him. So in Bukhari, there are 38 hadith from him. Uh, in Sahih Muslim, there are 24. In Abu Dawood, there's 12. In Tirmidhi, there's 38. So, you know, these people are narrating thousands of hadith. So you're not taking everything. It's not just a um, final judgment on an individual and affects everything. No. These experts, they were looking at individuals, but then they were also looking at reports. So he only took those reports of Ubaidullah bin Musa that he was certain came from the Prophet That's the important point here. So in this, Bukhari is an academic researcher. He's very academic and he has principles. So if he's certain that the report is sound based on all you know the criteria that they look at, uh, which includes the transmitter, but that's not the only criteria, then he will not deprive us of that. So Ubaidullah bin Musa narrates the hadith from Hamdallah ibn Abi Sufyan, ibn Abdurrahman, ibn Safwan, ibn Umayya. So, Hanzala died in the year 151. If you look at his lineage, Safwan ibn Umayya was his great-grandfather. And Safwan ibn Umayya was the son of Umayya bin Khalaf. Umayya bin Khalaf was a famous mushrik opponent of the Prophet, uh, sallam. So he was one of the enemies of the Prophet, Umayya, Abu Jahal, and these are the great the leaders of, of the opposition. And he died on shirk. But his son, Safwan, embraced Islam, and uh, but very late. So Safwan is the great-grandfather of Hanzala, 
Umayya bin Khalif is a great great grandfather. So Safwan was the person who, well, he was with his father for the whole lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu um, and he embraced Islam after the Fath. But even not immediately at the Fath, when when the Prophet um, opened Mecca, you know, he gave general amnesty, but there are a bunch of people who didn't want to become Muslim even then, and they fled Mecca. Safwan was one of those. So he fled Mecca. There's an interesting story, and he he was escaping to Rome. So he was actually leaving, and he didn't want to live under Islam. Um, he was still with his father, even to, at the end of the Prophet's life. And then, you know, one of his relatives, he came and uh, he asked the Prophet, you know, what if we would convince him to come and stay here? Does he really have amnesty? Uh, will you go after him? The Prophet said, no, give him indication that he's going to be forgiven. So that person went, and while he was riding the ship, he was on the coast about to leave. He managed to convince him. He still didn't want to come back. He was like, uh, well, maybe he's just saying that he'll kill me when I get back. And he was very fearful. And then he said, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. So the person eventually convinced him, and he came, and he grudgingly came, and uh, um, he came back to Mecca. And then in the Battle of Hunayn, you know, the famous Battle of Hunayn where Muslims were all, almost routed, but then they won, where the Prophet ﷺ was giving out all the spoils of war and the camels to all the Muslims that were new. And the Ansar got nothing, and they had tears in their eyes. So um, Safwan was the person that the Prophet gave 100 camels on that day because he was still on the fence. And that was a brilliant strategy on the part of the Prophet ﷺ. He was using these things to convince people and soften their hearts to Islam. So, you know, um, anyway, Safwan's great-grandson was Hanzala. Um, and Hanzala was a reliable transmitter of hadith. Uh, both Abu Hatim al-Razi and Abu Zura al-Razi deemed him a thiqa. So we have Ubaidullah bin Musa. We're on hadith one for those who came. Bab, the first hadith of Kitab al-Iman, Bunya al-Islam wa so Ubaidullah bin Musa relates a hadith from Hanzala and he relates a hadith from Akrima ibn Khalid. Akrima ibn Khalid died in the year 115. He was the son of Sa'id ibn al-As ibn Hisham ibn al-Mughira uh, of Bani Makhdum. He was a student of ibn Abbas ibn Umar and all the hadith experts said he was fully reliable, thiqa, by consensus. Uh, and there's in fact not a single person out there that was known to have weakened him or say he had problems with 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 his narration. So Akirama ibn Khalid, fully reliable. Um, and then he relates from who? Ibn Umar radiallahu an. So the hadith comes from Ibn Umar, and the hadith is Buni al Islamu ala khams. Islam is built upon five Shahada to Allah ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. The five pillars of the faith. Okay, five pillars of the faith. Now, every hadith we read, you have to look at the broader vision of Bukhari. What are we learning? What book is under? Kitabul Iman. So you need to bring that back to Kitabul Iman. So, and then the hadith has to do with Islam. So, what is the connection there? The hadith doesn't mention Iman, it mentions Islam. So, why is it mentioned here from last week's discussion? Let me open the floor. So why why would this hadith fit in this chapter for you? Let me just open that up, yeah. Anyone? Anyone online? Yeah, I, I would look at it as the fact that these are the things that build your iman. Yeah, excellent. So you know, so this is actually Islam, but Islam and Iman are so related. You can't have one without the other. So like when you have Iman, Iman comes from the mind, but then once you believe in Allah, you make that, that heart makes that switch, then your actions, your body parts have to follow. The whole thing is, Iman is qawl and amal, right? The statement, but it's also action. So Iman is also action. So Islam is action. These are your actions. So Islam is built upon these five pillars of practice. So that's part of Iman, because Iman is starting point and it leads you there. So if you have these pillars of practice without Iman, they, they're useless. 
But if you have iman and you don't have the practice of the amal, that's not really iman. That's what they're trying to get at. So many Muslims believe, no, you can have iman, but you're just, you know, it's, you know, like if you have iman, it has to lead you to worship. There's no such thing as iman without worship. So that step has to be taken. The worship could be problematic or weak or, you know, you can have ups and downs, but there has to, that step has to be taken. So um, that's what he's trying to say. Like iman with iman, there has to be amal. With iman, there's always Islam. And in the Quran and the Sunnah, it's all related. When we read our books, we want to separate everything into neat categories. And that's the problems that we get where we separate things and we like to define things. Well, iman is your beliefs. That's one problematic definition we come up with. But then, what about prayer? What does that have to do with iman? Oh, it's just your practice. But it's it's all connected. It's all related. And Allah uses iman interchangeably with, with amal. And that's the whole purpose of this entire chapter with almost more than 50 hadith. This long tarjuma, the preamble of this chapter, Bukhari is uh, showing you all of these things, uh, teaching you all of these things. So, Islam, bunya al-Islam ala khams. This hadith teaches us the structure of your practice, of your faith, the physical structure of Islam. Iman is that, you can say, internal process that leads you to this. This is the physical structure. What is it that Muslim does? It's the five pillars. Shahada, testimony of faith, there's a salah, there's a zakat, there's a hajj, and there's a Ramadan. So now we have to say this and then we'll move on. Um, this particular hadith mentions an order that Hajj comes from before fasting. But is there a logical order to these or is they are they random? Is there a correct order or a, let's say, thought? These five pillars, is there a proper logical order that they come in or not? So what should be first? Obviously, is there any dispute? Shahada is the first. What should be the last here? Any ideas? Hajj. Yeah. Why? Why should Hajj be the last? Okay, good. That's one way of looking at it. It's not farther than everyone because you start with Shahada. Everyone, these are like five revolving doors. Everyone has to enter to Shahada. If you don't, you're not Muslim. You don't have Iman. Everyone enters through the first door. Second door is Salah. How many people pray? We like to think most people pray, most Muslim, but Everyone knows Muslims that don't pray at all. Everyone has, like, I have rel I had relatives that don't pray, did not pray at all. We're not talking about pray and miss prayers, like at all. So there's still Muslims that don't go through the second door. And then the third door is what? Zakat. So, you know, it's all logically connected because Shahada is the testimony of faith. And as soon as you make the testimony of faith, Allah says, now immediately you have to prove your faith. You have to use your body to worship me. That's the purpose of your life. But then the third step is where Allah says, now if you have blessings that you enjoy from me, you have to be willing to share and you have to give them in fee sabili left for my sake. And that is zakat. But now that, how many Muslims go through that door? There are Muslims that don't give it when they should, but there are so many Muslims that never, they're, they're poor. They just can't give. So there are people who never go through that door because they just can't. Um, and then then four or five, here it says Hajj and then Ramadan. But Hajj should be the last because Ramadan, everyone has to do it unless you're sick. But there are people who are ill and they're born with illness, so they never fast. So they never go through that door. But generally, most people do go through that door. But Hajj is that, that last pillar that really is, there really is no... There's no other way to look at it. Like logically, it has to be the last, because there's so many ways of looking at it. One is that you know it's once in a lifetime, and many people never have the chance to do it. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, Hajj is a pillar that summarizes everything. It's that last door that just summarizes in a beautiful way all of the previous pillars. You have Shahada in there, remembrance of Allah. You have you know spending. Fisabilillah in there, you have salah in there, and you have fasting in there because fasting is linked to hajj in some way. How people are making hajj, they don't fast. But if you, you know, there is, uh, what is the verse? Sabaatun idha rajatum tilka asharatun kamila. What's the verse before that? The, the three. 
um, in some situations, you know, um, you have to, the expiation is to fast for 10 days, three days in Hajj and seven when you get back. And also all of us fast in the day of Arafah, we're connected to Hajj. That's our connection to the Hajj. So fasting is part of Hajj in that way. Uh, so Hajj is the final pillar. It's the last of the obligations. And it's that pillar that summarizes everything, teaches you how to live as a Muslim, that simple cloth, the brotherhood, everything in Islam that Islam stands for, you see it in the Hajj. It symbolizes that. And, and not only that, there's so many other proofs that Hajj is the last. For instance, uh, what's one of the final verses that were revealed? Um, where, you know, the famous story of the Jews came to Umar ibn al Khattab and they said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, ayatun fi kitabikum. Here's a verse you read in your scripture. If we had a verse like that, that day would be a holiday for us. And Omar asked him what verse? What was the verse? Today, I have finalized your religion for you. That's the meaning of the verse, the, the paraphrasing. Today is perfect. Is complete, it's final. Today, Allah used the word today. And what was that day, that today? Omar said, what was the day? Day of Hajj, Yawm al-Arafah. Yawm al-Arafah, and the Hajj of the Prophet So this verse was revealed where Allah said, "We today I have completed your deen for you. That was in Hajj. So Hajj is the final pillar. So this hadith should have Hajj at the end, but it doesn't. But actually, if you look up the hadith in Sahih Muslim, for instance, um, Ibn Omar related this hadith and he said this. He said, Bunya al Islam wa ala khamsa, ala in you wahid Allah, wa iqami salah, wa ita is zakah, wa sawmi Ramadan, wa al Hajj. So he gave the right order. Someone in the audience said, Ya Aba Abdul Rahman, um, Hajju wa sawm. He said, Isn't it Hajj first and then sawm? Because this is how this hadith is. Because that means at that time, many companions were memorizing the hadith this way, and many of them were memorizing the other way. So Ibn Umar, he related the other way, and he said to him, no. He said, he said, Siyamu wal Hajj, hakada sami'tuhu min Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Umar said, no. Saum comes first, and then Hajj. This is how I heard it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this hadith in Sahih Muslim. So from here we learn the, the real order is Sawm and Hajj. In Hajj, all the proofs teach us that is the final uh, pillar. Also, you know, Omar ibn al-Khattab, when he made the calendar, the Islamic calendar, people think uh, the Islamic calendar is etched in time. It was, it was an ishtihad of the companions. The months were fixed. There were no years though. And there was no month one. Like we know Muharram, uh, well, we know Dhul Qi'da, then Dhul Hijjah, then Muharram. But which one is the first month? Like, where does the new year start? Well, now it starts in Muharram. Did it start like that in the Prophet's time? No. So for centuries, they had these months in order, but there was no month number one, month number two. It was just months that came after the other. The early, uh, you know, pre-modern society, they weren't obsessed with dates, and they weren't obsessed with, like, this idea of New Year's and these celebrations and things like that. So the months who came in order from the time Allah created the heavens and the earth, but there was no numbering of the years and no numbering of the months. So Omar, he, when he devised the Islamic calendar, he had a discussion among the companions because the companions said, look, we travel all over the world. We go to Rome, we go to Persia. They have their own calendars. We write you letters and then the letters reach you some weeks later and we don't know when it was written like except a month and so we need to fix our calendar like the other societies they do that so Omar said he thought about it, he said okay sounds like a good idea what do you think and he brought all the companions so they said okay let's fix the years because that's the main thing they were looking at what, year, what, what were the years so we can have years so they discussed the matter and they, they asked they, they talked about various uh, things so one of the things that came up well how about when the prophet passed let's make that the first year but that was too sad. So they didn't want to pick that. They didn't want to use that as a memory. 
So they rejected that idea. Then all these other ideas came up. Um, but then eventually it was decided the year the Prophet made the Hijrah, that would be year one, because that's where Islam was put on the map. Um, but then, so that discussion was settled uh, through, a, through, or that, that, that was settled through a discussion. The second issue was the month. Okay, which is month number one? Now that discussion wasn't that long because there weren't that many options. Because why? Because everyone had a clear conception in their mind that Hajj is the last pillar. Therefore, Dhul Hajj, Dhul Hijjah should be month number 12. Because Dhul Hijjah is month number 12, then Muharram became the first month. Nothing else to it. Is there's nothing to Muharram that makes it special that this is the new year and so on and so forth. It's only because of Dhul Hijjah. And that's a proof that Hajj is the final pillar and this is the right order. So now the question arises, okay, why is this order here? Because the Muhaddithin, they're relating Hadith as they hear it. And even the grammatical mistakes are sometimes related in the Hadith. Even like that Hadith of Sahih Muslim where the seven shaded under the throne of Allah the day there is no shade but his, one of them is a man who spends secretly out of his wealth such that his right hand doesn't know what his left hand is spending. That's an obvious mistake because you give your charity with your right hand, but the right and left was switched by a narrator. But Imam, Bukhari, uh, Imam Muslim continued that hadith in the same way because they're just relating it as is. And they just, they understand that you know what was going on here, that you know what the they weren't obsessed with like you know the words we knew that people anyone that has a sense of things knows what happened and the real order is this so anyway these are the two ways this hadith is narrated um but the right order is som wal hajj wallahu a'lam that's hadith number one any questions on hadith number one just a clarification yes so Ibn Umar and he when he narrated it, he put it in the in the correct order. So where does the reordering occur then? Oh, excellent. So excellent question. So so now when you look at this hadith, if you look at it in front of you, there's it's coming from Abdullah bin Musa, from Hanzala, from Ikrima, from Ibn Umar. And that hadith has the non proper order. So what's going on here? There's a number of possibilities. First of all, you need to understand that. It's probably not Ibn Umar that switched it, right? Or it possibly is. But like the when there's a mistake in the text of the hadith, it could be from anywhere in the chain. Because Ibn Umar perhaps could have narrated in the right way in this particular snad, but then maybe Akrima, maybe Hanzala mixed it up. And then he narrated to the student to, to his student after him and it reached us. So that could have been anywhere in the chain. Now, Ibn Hajar and Hadith expert, what they do, they do comparative analyses to try to figure out where it is or who messed it up. Sometimes they come to the answer, but most of the times it's very difficult to know. So these kind of changes can happen um, in any of the, through any of the names. So the assumption that Ibn Umar changed it up in this particular version is not, it has to be proven. You can't make that assumption automatically. Um, yeah, Allahu Alam. And it's also possible, another possibility is that the Prophet ﷺ could have said it both ways. That's a more remote possibility. It's more likely that the Prophet said it in one way and people memorized it and they just, you know, it's, it's perfectly natural. This should not, you know, bother anybody. You know, when you list five things, when you tell your children five things to do, you know, you'll mix up the order sometimes. Even when you talk about verses of Quran, when you're teaching the meanings, like um, in the verse where Allah in the, in the, uh, Allah has knowledge of five things, right? When you relate those five things to your students in class and Sunday school, sometimes the order will get mixed up. But that's a natural thing. There's nothing wrong with that. When you're reading the Quran, then you know you need to be exact. But when you're teaching it, like things will go here and there. And that's what all these hadith represent. They're teachings from one generation to another, one person to another person to another person. And anywhere along, along the line, innocent switches can happen. That's why in Bayquniya we had a category of hadith called maqloob. 
قلب اسناد باسناد قسم وقلب متن باسناد قسم something like that that sometimes there's a switch that happens in the isnad one name for another rawin bi rawin or isnad bi isnad so these things can happen and scholars uncover that um, and they have tools to do that wallahu a'lam can I do another follow up yes go ahead so i'm assuming bukhari had access to the other version as well mm -hmm. so that's an excellent question the, so, so why, why that version one? wasn't there <laughs> Yeah, excellent question. So who knows? Um, um, we need to study Bukhari more deeply, and maybe someone has an answer. But certainly, I it's not my. Uh, I haven't studied in that in that depth. I believe he doesn't have the other order, if I'm not mistaken. That's only in Sahih Muslim. Allahu alam. If you come across any readings, just do share with us. Inshallah. Uh, Ibad had a question. Use that mic, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give an example of a hadith like narrator said uh, that he mixed up? He said that you give charity with your left hand so much that your right hand doesn't know. Mm -hmm. So you said, I just wanted to like uh, clarify that that was a hadith that's been preserved in Muslim. Yeah, as it as it as is. it is, okay. right left switch, and he kept the switch. And some scholars they even kept like grammatical mistakes. So I mean, there's different approaches to narrating hadith. Some were very exact, like Shorba, and tried to preserve the wording as much as possible. But this generation, Bukhari and Muslim, when they're writing things down, documents, they're trying to be as exact as they receive things, not trying to fix things. If you start fixing everything, like then, um, then imagine you fix something that doesn't need to be fixed. You can imagine all the problems that can happen. But generally speaking, hadith is related by wording and by meaning. Like so, it's trying to be exact, but there's also always words that go here and there. And that's perfectly natural and normal. In those cases, do they comment or do they just, like it's just... Like yeah, reader. so in these hadith dictation sessions, hadith, uh, they comment. So today, how do you find those comments? You look at Fatul Bari. They'll have long discussions. They have Fatul Bari, Ibn Hajar, what he does is, okay, this hadith has this word here. The hadith in this chapter has a slightly different word. The hadith from this companion has a different word. The hadith in Sahih Muslim has a different wording and has a different question. So he tries to bring all of them together to try to give you a, a real-time view of what he thinks, an analysis, a judgment call of what happened. And then sometimes then the scholars would point out things. And sometimes when they point out, the thing is the problem with those comments, right? So you would imagine if I'm Sufyan ibn Aryan, I'm teaching hadith, and I come across this, I'll say to all those students, like 10,000 students in the audience, well, this hadith, this is what happened. You know what's going to happen. Maybe a thousand out of those 10,000 students are going to write what I said as part of the hadith. And we saw examples of that happening. So when you're teaching hadith, when you're reciting Quran, you're trying to be exact with the words. But then, you know, uh, generally the earlier you go in generations, they try to stick to the words of Quran and Sunnah. And their commentary and their explanations were much less. The later in time you go, the explanation of scholars became more and more, and the, and the, the hadith became shorter and shorter. And today we need to spend an hour speaking about this hadith. But in those times, it's well understood. Everyone knew what it meant. They read the hadith, just brief things if needed, but then move on because the knowledge was much higher. Allah Alam. Anyone else? Okay. So let's go to hadith number two. Um, who wants to read? Let someone from the audience read. Bab Umur al Iman. Someone read. Danielle, your your job is a microphone to call on somebody. If no one volunteers, you assign somebody to read. <laughs> I have a second mic for the sisters. Bab Umur al Iman. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Bab umur al iman. Wa kawli lahi ta'ala, laysa birra an tuwalla wujuhakum kibal al mashriki wal maghrib, walakin al birra man amana billah, wa kitabu wa nabiyin, wa atamala ala hubbihi dawa al-kurba, wa yatamma wa al-masakin wa abna al-sabil, 
والسائلين في الرقاب وقام الصلاة وآت الزكاة والموفون بأهدهم إذا آهدوا والصابرين في البساء والدراء وهنا البأس أولئك الذين صدقوا وأولئك هم المتقون Keep going one more line uh, Elbuk <coughs> Al Bakara one eighty eight one seventy seven. Hmm. Wakat uh cut afla al Ayat al Mukminun Adathana Okay, that's it. Okay. So that's uh, that's the beginning of the, the Tarjumatul Bab. Okay. So the next chapter uh, has to do is called Bab Umur al Iman, matters related to Iman. Okay. So now Mukhari wants to mention other matters related to Iman. So Iman is a vast idea. It's a grand idea, as we mentioned last week. It's something, uh, you know, very uh, complex, very beautiful, and it's something grand. It's not something you can summarize. It's related to emotions, related to actions. So here he wants to go on and, and mention how Iman is related to other things like worship. Some of them are, have to do with akhlaq. And so Iman, again, is not just what you believe, but with Iman, action necessarily comes. And with action, akhlaq necessarily comes. All the things are necessarily connected, very much connected. So he shares with you two verses. The first verse is talking about leis al birra. Bir, the idea of bir. Bir is translated as what? Piety, uh, very bad translation, but uh, righteousness, also bad translation. Um, so bir is has no equivalent in any language actually. So bir is something like, kind of like iman, is something so broad and something so deep in Arabic. Uh, so bir basically means that you obey Allah, uh, but you obey Allah not because you're forced to, you obey Allah because you're loyal to Allah and you love Allah. So it has like three elements. If you summarize the, the meaning of bir, it's the obedience of God, through full loyalty to God and through full love of God. Um, that's why, so it's so better you have to understand it in the context of ta, obedience. You could obey somebody because you're forced to. That's the law of the land. You know, you're going to do this because that's the law. You don't like it, but you do it. And there are many Muslims that, that pray because they have to, it's not in their heart. Um, so you can obey Allah without necessarily the other components. But bitter is something much deeper, much more profound. Bitter is where you obey Allah motivated by your love and your loyalty. Loyalty, you have no other person to turn to and there's no other option for you. You don't want anyone else you want to be attached to. That's why you're going to obey him. And through mahabba, love. So the three components of bitter in Arabic would be ita'a, obedience. Muwalat, loyalty, and mahabba, love. And that is why when Allah speaks about parents, what is the word he used? Does he use ati, atiru? He says birrul walidain. He uses this term because with your parents, you don't obey them like they're police officers and you have to, but you have full loyalty to them. This is the perfect word that makes sense for that context because you're loyal to your parents no matter what they how imperfect your parents are, no matter what you go through, at the end of the day, your parents are your parents, your father is your father, your mother is your mother. You still, there, the element of that will never change. That loyalty is always there. It might be weak. You might not be attached to your parent. You might, you might not even know your father or your mother. You might be an orphan or, but still in, in built in you is that sense of loyalty. That's my, that's my father, that's my mother, that's my family. And then also, in most scenarios, there's love. So even the child, when the mother beats him, where is he going to run off to? He's going to run around in circles and come back to the mother, right? Because the child has no other place to turn. There's the love of the mother is built in the child. So that's why bitter is used for parents, rather than when it comes to obeying those in authority, Allah says, أَتِيُّ اللَّهُ وَأَتِيُّ الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ Ita'a is used for like a king or for other things. Uh, also used for Allah in many verses, but bitter when it's used um, 
in Islam, generally this is the meaning, okay? So it's obedience to God, but out of full love and loyalty. Now, so here Allah mentions what bir is, some components of bir, what examples of bir. So what kind, what does the obedience of God look like? What does piety or, or righteousness as it's translated as looks like? Um, so the context of these verses is about Bani Israel. Bani Israel had many, like, you know, we're going to talk about it in the tafsir class too. The, the Bani Israel, the Jews, they were excessively focused on form and structure and not the spirit of the law. So, you know, they were obeying God, but in their own way, but, you know, almost they didn't do it. Um, so, and you can see in Surah Al-Baqarah is filled with those examples. So, here Allah is reminding them, look, this is what real piety is. This is what real obedience to God looks like. The real obedience to God that comes from love and comes with loyalty to Allah. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَهُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ <clears throat> Bitter is not turning your face to the east or the west. So the context here where the Jews were discussing the Qibla of Jerusalem versus Mecca, there are all these debates. So Allah is reminding them, it's not the east or the west. It's not the turning of your face that's piety, that's bir. It's something else. That's just like a symbol. That's just something Allah created that for us, like just to have a direction. But that's not the real act. That's not the. That's not where it is. That's the direction of the Qibla is, doesn't mean that that's where Allah is. When you face the Kaaba, doesn't mean that Allah is physically there. Allah is not there, but it's a direction that we need in order to make our worship easier. We need, we need some form and some structure. So, you know, facing the Qibla is only in place of, um, so it just it's, just, it's a superficial thing. It's a symbolic thing. Yes, we face the Qibla, but that's not what the real value is. The real value the Islamic value, Islamic teaching, bitter is this. It's not facing the east or the west. Real bitter are those who put their iman in Allah. Iman is bitter. Iman in Allah, belief in Allah is bitter. That's what real obedience looks like. Al Imanu Billahi Man Amana Billahi Wal Yawmil Akhiri. And then belief in the day of judgment. So <clears throat> this is the foundations of piety, foundations of, of obedience, of, of, you know, of bitter. Starts with iman. Without iman, there is no bitter. You can be all the, the nicest person in the world, do all the good deeds. Without iman, it's all useless in, 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 in the teachings of Islam. So iman is first, but iman in what? Iman in Allah, but then iman in the last day. Well, yawm al-akhir is very, very important. Because sincerity can never come without belief in the last day. If you don't believe in the last day, or your belief in the akhirah is weak, then everything you do in this life is for a purpose, for ulterior motive. You know, you're going to look at, I need to help this person, but I need to get something in return. Um, there's always this ulterior motives for your actions, because you don't believe you're rewarded in the next life, then everything is about this life. Then, then your responses to action is going to be so, um, you know, disproportionate but the believer they believe in Allah and they have this sense of the last day that changes their whole approach to life and you know what's going on in Gaza may Allah relieve that situation um, you know the Israelis and the Jews in general um, it is shocking to me when I realize the Jews don't believe in the afterlife I can't get over that I still can't get over that you might say what like they really don't believe in an afterlife like when he asked them, and I've asked so many people, I've asked in interfaith gathering rabbis, do you believe in the afterlife? The answer is usually, like, oh, well, we don't really emphasize it or something like that. So if they do believe, some of them do believe in an afterlife, they're, it's something so relegated in their religion that has no um, reality for them. It doesn't inform their faith and tradition. And that is why when something happens to one of them in Israel, the response is so disproportionate. The world ends for them. They make life hell for everyone because this is it for them. It's not like, you know, for a believer, how many, you know, we've been going through this. The Muslims have been going through this a million times worse. 
again and again and again, even worse than the Holocaust, and I'll say it again and again and again, when the partition of India and Pakistan was similar to Holocaust level numbers of people who died. But we get over it because we know this is a temporary life. We're here for a few days. There's a day of judgment. And inshallah, Allah sees everything. And if we don't worry too much. It doesn't destroy our lives. But when your belief in the last day is gone, then this life becomes everything. And then, you know, then your whole conception and your behavior changes. And you can't be sincere in your actions. So when you real piety better comes with belief in Allah and the strong sense of the afterlife that Allah is watching everything I do. Um, and then, wal malaikati, and also belief in the angels. Why is the belief in the angels important? Because the angels are Allah's hidden agents. Um, belief in the angels connects you to Allah very clearly. Because if you don't have that, then there's more possibilities of shirk and destroying your belief in Allah. Why? Because many things happen in the world that you can't explain. If you don't have this belief in Allah's hidden agents, Allah sends these beings that we cannot see, that control the heavens, the earth, the winds, and when you're about to get into an accident, and there's an angel that'll stop you, and then when you don't believe in that, that these agents are there, um, then you'll attribute those things to supernatural things or, or false gods, and, and there's more possibilities of attributing things to material objects like idols. It's the idol that did that. But like the belief in the angels makes the world more real, the world of the ghayb more real for you, connects you with Allah. It makes you realize the angels are all commands of Allah. The whole world is running by the command of Allah. And these things that we can't explain, um, even those are through the commands of Allah. So you're not that frightened by ghaybiyat matters. Um, and you're strong, more strongly connected to Allah. And then, wal kitabi wal nabiyin. Then the books and the prophets. Kitabi wal nabiyin. That's also very, very important because part of the belief of, in Allah is that, I, mean, I think we did mention it last week, that uh, part of Tawheed is that, you know, if Allah is one and He promised to guide us, then there's going to be guidance. So it's going to be in the form of books and it's going to be in the form of messengers. So it's going to be instructions in writing. And there's going to be human beings that will teach us how to live those teachings. So it's not just the kitab, but it's also the rasul. It's not just the kutu, the scriptures, but it's also the anbiya, the prophets that Allah chose and sent. So this is very, very important as well. Um, so, and then, وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ And then you give your wealth, despite your love for the wealth, you share it with others. Ala hubbihi here, there's a debate, okay, what does it go back to? Ala hubbihi, by the love of Allah, or the love of wealth? It's more proper for love of wealth because love of Allah would be lillah, fi sabi lillah, or you know, lillahi. But ala hubbihi kind of means despite your love for it. So you give your wealth, you share it with others, even though you like it even though you're attached to these things, even though you're attached to your wealth, you're attached to your house, attached to your gardens, you're attached to these things. But despite that, you give that, you share it with others, that is real bitter. And that is why these are, these are the core teachings of the faith. This verse is a beautiful verse. Teachings are the most important core principles of what bitter is. What are the teachings of our faith? And there's nothing here that's redundant, and there's nothing here that shouldn't belong. So it's not about facing the east or west. That means those rules are not important about where you're facing. But what's real important is Iman. And Iman in what? Allah and the angels and the books and the messengers, the last day. And also spending out of your wealth, helping others, sharing your wealth with others. If Allah gives you, why? Allah is the one who gave it to you. Why wouldn't you share it with others? That's why Qarun, who's the most wealthy person in the Quran, you know, one of the advice they gave, وَبْتَغِي فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ Use what Allah gave you to build your house in the next life. Share it with others. That they were reminding him. Because Allah gave you that. Well, don't think that it's yours. Allah gave it to you. Why should you not share? And then, it's so beautiful here that despite your love for it, you share that wealth with others. But now, share that. So, here it's going against your nafs. You know, you don't want to share the wealth, you do it. And Allah mentioned, ala hubbihi, despite your love and attachment to that. That's why when you give, you're supposed to give the best things that you have. 
there's a clothing drive. What we do, we look at the clothes we want to get rid of that we're never going to wear, and we give them away, and we feel good about it. That's not what this verse is speaking about. That's still there's a reward there, um, but that's not real bitter. Real bit is you give the things that you like, that are close to you, you give them away. Well, and then who do you give it to? Allah mentions not the people that you want, not your priorities. If it was up to us, we would give well to the places and, and that, we, that might benefit us in the end, people that we want to grow closer to. But Allah gives his priorities of sharing your well. That will qurba, your relatives. That's why your relatives are a priority. Most people in the world, unfortunately, I mean, you have family, but most people are estranged from their families, unfortunately. There's always, every family has problems between individuals. So, and the problems in families are so deep that it destroys families. They don't talk to each other. Then it affects even their subsequent generations sometimes. But here Allah is reminded, despite all of that, your priority, if some relative is, is, is in need, that's the priority for you to help him out or her out. And it doesn't matter whether you, you like them or not, you're estranged or not, or you have relations or not. You're supposed to keep those relations. So first priority is your relatives, the closest relatives. Waliyatama, and then the orphans, those who have no one to look out for, and those who don't have parents of their own. So these are the priorities of spending your wealth. Relatives, orphans, walmasakin, and the, pover the poor ones, the impoverished ones. So are the ones you, you need to um, seek out to help. Wabna Sabil. Wabna Sabil is what? The son of the road, son of the path. What does that mean? Travelers, yes. So traveling used to be a very difficult process, not so much now, but even now it kind of is. Um, so travelers, you know, they really had no... Um, place of their own, they had no people to turn to, and you travel you're at the mercy of the element. Even now, traveling anywhere around the world without a visa and all this whole lengthy processes, it's very difficult to get around. So even with visas, it's difficult to get around in many countries, um, some bit more than others. So Allah mentions one of his priorities, help the people who are not from your land, who are traveling. And these are people, you have to realize that the whole thing here is a training of the nafs. These are people you're probably never going to see again. Someone passing by, you know, like you give him something or you help him out, your expectation, your nafs tells you he might help you out in the future. But Allah's giving you priority people you will never see again because this is really for Allah. That's what real bitter is. And you know that you did good and you will never see that person again, but, you know, you do it for, for, for the sake of Allah. Now the people who are beggars. So the beggars or people who are asking for help. That's also a category. It's not a good thing to ask for help, but it's a reality. People do exist like that. For, so Allah mentions, you know, um, They have a right to your wealth. Haq. So even those who ask the beggar, they have a um, right to your wealth. Now, shaitan will come and say, well, he doesn't really deserve it, and so on and so forth. Now, that onus is not on you. Like, if someone asks for help, you don't have to, you know, go to the ends of the earth to make sure that he really needs it, right? If you give someone who doesn't deserve it, you still get that reward, and the, the rest is on him. Now, that doesn't mean... You give it out, um, you know, when, when you know someone doesn't deserve it. Just means you shouldn't be asking and inquiring about that. I mean, there are many professional beggars that um, make a profession out of it, and we know that they're part of mafias, and that's a different situation. But generally speaking, we should be more generous and err on the side of caution. Help out people as much as we can, even those who are asking for help and beggars. Um, so just imagine if Allah commands us to respect those who beg, what about the ones who beg Allah, right? So he tells us not to turn away the beggar. You know, if that's what Allah is teaching us, Allah is never going to turn away people who ask him for help. So there's so many deep lessons in here. And then wafir riqab, those who are enslaved. So slaves. So 
we don't really have that today. But slavery was an economic thing back in those days. It's very much an economic. Uh, so the closest thing we would have that to that is the debtors, people involved in debt. Because that's really economic slavery. And that's really what indenture servitude was. And even in early times, you know, um, that kind of explains much of what slavery was. It was a part of paying your debts back. So, um, and maybe you can apply it to prisoners also. Prisoners who are, you know, confined to institutions. Um, so, what does he say next? And then establish the salah. Well, this is what real worship is. Salah is the essence of worship, essence of gratitude. This is all about gratitude. Allah gave you all these things. Our iman is, in, in the essence of iman itself is gratitude. So, Now, Allah repeats charity, but now in a different context. This is the zakat, that surplus that you have. You have to give it uh, in those fixed proportions uh, to also, it's also fixed proportions. And those who fulfill their covenants and their promises. This is also a core teaching, and that's something so scary today. I don't think most of the most the Muslim woman has a problem with that, sticking to their words, sticking to their promises, especially in the Muslim world. A word is meaningless. Those who stick to their covenants and promises and obligations when they when they promise them. So Muslims must stay true to their word. This is part of bitter. This is what real bitter is. It's very hard, but it's, it, this is what bitter is. And what's next? Was sabirin. Was sabirin fil ba'sa'i wa darra'i wa al ba's. Those who are sabirin. So sabr is very, very deep. It's not just patient. Is something much more profound than that. Um, but here, there's three things. Sabr in what? Sabr has a sense of persistence, perseverance, keep going, uh, patience, not complaining. And so there's all these senses built in. But Sabirin are the people in Gaza, are Sabirin. Sabirin are the people who are poor and they just keep going. They keep going and living life without asking others. Sabirin are people who obey Allah in difficult circumstances they're surrounded by sin they're surrounded by you know calls to disobedience music and zina and they refuse to do any of that because they obey allah that's all of that is sabirin but sabirin allah mentions um uh, um ba'sa is connected to wealth and the ra is connected to your physical well physical body and hin al ba's ba's is connected to warfare so when you're tested in terms of monetary trials sabr when you're tested physically illness and death in your family and uh, things to your physical body sabr when you're tested with wars and and hostile conflicts also sabr so that's not easy. It comes by training. Sabr is very, very difficult. It comes through training. And that is a final teaching here among these great core teachings of Islam, what bitter is. Um, and then he says, what, what Allah says, Ulaika ladina sadaqu wa ulaika humul muttaqun. Allah describes these people who have this bitter. That these are the people who are truthful, sadiqun. And these are the people of taqwa, people of siddiq. They're truthful in speech and, 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 and their word and their actions, and they're people of taqwa. So it's a great, great verse to include here. So Imam Bukhari is trying to give you that broad conception of what Iman leads you to and what bir is. Now he's highlighting bir. And then at the end, the next verse, qad aflah al mu'minun. He just quotes the beginning of Surah Al Mu'minun. Verily, truthful indeed are those who are believers. Now tying it back to Iman. Iman is what gives you success. Nothing else. Iman is what gives you success. Okay. So with that preamble, that's the Tarjumatul Bab. Again, this is the Bab. And the verses are part of the Tarjumatul Bab, the chapter heading. And now the Hadith begins. Who wants to read the Hadith?
Okay. Bismillah. حدثنا عبد الله بن عبد الله ابن محمد حدثنا أبو عامر. Do you have قالا in there? No. No, I don't. Okay. So when you have حدثنا حدثنا, the the missing word is قالا. So you say قالا حدثنا. Some of the manuscripts have it. My book has it. But if it doesn't have it, you still read it. So start from the beginning. حدثنا عبد. حدثنا عبد الله بن محمد. حدثنا. قال حدثنا. قال حدثنا أبو عامر الأقدي. أقدي. أقدي. قال حدثنا سليمان بن بلال. عبد الله بن دينار. عن أبي صالح. عن أبي ضريرة. عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. قال الإيمان بدون وستون شعبة. والخيال شعبة من الإيمان. Good, very good. So Bismillah. So. This hadith, let's let's do the hadith first, then we'll come back to the isnad, right? Maybe that'll be easier. Um, so he's, the Prophet wasallam. he said, Iman is 60-something branches, consists of 60-something branches. Bid'un wa situna in Arabic, bid'ar is like a small number when you're not sure of the number. So generally, bid'ar is, is used between 5 and 10. When there's a number, unspecified number between five and ten, uh, you use, um, or sorry, uh, bed is more than one, but less than ten. So it's generally you can say three to nine, the number three to nine. When there's ten, you use ashara. Um, when there's an unspecified number and it's more than three and less than nine, then bedarun is the term that's used. So when you say bedarun was situna, it means 60 something. It's somewhere between 63 to 69. Had it been 70, you would have used the word sabreen. Had it been 60 or 61, it's easier to do that. But when there's an unspecified number, so sometimes you use the expression bidrun. So iman is bidrun wa situna shorba. Iman is 60 something branches. Wal haya u shorbatum min al iman. And haya is a branch of iman so this is a famous hadith and it comes in many other versions um, there is a version of that where you use the word 70 something uh, and there's a version where it says the highest branch is this the lowest branch of this and haya is somewhere in the middle what's the highest branch in the version La ilaha illallah. Afdaluha wa a'alaha qawlu la ilaha illallah. The highest branch is the statement of la ilaha illallah. Wa adnaha was the lowest branch from the other narration. Yeah, imatatul adha an itari. Removing something harmful from the road. So this is all part of iman. And then haya'u shu'batun min al iman. Haya or modesty, bashfulness is a branch of iman so there's something incredible because like even the prophet وسلم, is teaching the same thing all these are branches of iman so a branch of iman means the iman is the root and these stem out of iman so they're part of iman so you know it's very clear from the quran from the teachings of the prophet وسلم, they considered all of these things to be connected to iman in a strong way so who are we to create categories where everything disconnected and then that leads to a whole different way of looking at the Islam and the world. But all these things are part of Iman. Highest is qawlu la ilaha illallah, removing something harmful from the road. It's just a character trait. It's just something small that you do. That's part of Iman. And haya is an attitude. Haya is a sense of bashfulness, shyness. Um, that is part of Iman. And that's, that's, that's not a physical action, but that's like a behavior, that's a akhlaq characteristic. So, you know, we, there's so much that can be said about haya, but we, I think we covered that in the Arba'in. One of the hadith uh, had to do with haya. Haya is one of those distinctive qualities of our ummah, 
that we still hold and all the other Ummas, all the other nations lost, uh, the sense of shyness and bashfulness. Uh, and it's one of the things that were remnants of the Namima Adrak, Adrak min Kalam in Nubuatil Ula, and the Prophet said, one of the things we still hold on to from the teaching of the earliest prophets is this idea of Haya. So Haya is part of Iman. And so that's what he's trying to prove here. Okay. Um, any questions? Then I'll do the Isnad. Okay, so this hadith comes from his teacher, Abdullah ibn Muhammad. So who was he? So his full name was Abu Ja'far, Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Ja'far al-Musnadi, al-Musnadi. So it's more known as Abu Ja'far al-Musnadi or Abdullah ibn Muhammad al-Musnadi. So his title al-Musnadi is how he's known as. He died in the year 229. So he is among the 20 teachers of Imam Bukhari from whom he relates more than half the Sahih. So I mentioned them in a slide in the last seminar. So there are 20 teachers of Bukhari from whom more than half of the Sahih comes from. So if you want to learn the biographies of his teachers and you don't want to do all of them, he had a thousand teachers, but just these 20 are the top. So when any, any it's not comes from one of these 20, I'll let you know there's one of the 20. And you know that there's going to be many more hadith coming from him. So he was a great hadith expert of Bukhara. Um, so he has a strong connection with Bukhari in this following way. Number one, he's from Bukhara, same town. So he's from the same region as Bukhari, is one of his teachers. So that's, that's a connection there. But there's another greater connection. Um, and that connection is, if you look at the lineage of Abu Jafar bin Muhammad bin Jafar, and you go back, his great grandfather was Yaman al Jafi, who was a governor of Bukhara. So Al Musnadi's great grandfather was Yaman al Jafi. And who was Yaman al Jafi? We did mention him in the first seminar. What is his connection to Bukhari? No, anyone remember? No. Yaman al Jafi, you, you know? No, this because this is much earlier. This is great grandfather. This is early, early times, three generations before. He was a governor. Yeah. So, what was his connection with Mughira? It's Mughira. There's the, in what? I know, but in what? In, because right now we're talking about Al Musnadi. We are bringing. He's the first Muslim in whose family? Yeah. So Bukhari's great grandfather was Mughira. Mughira embraced Islam at the hands of Yaman al Jafi. So great grandfather of his teacher gave Shahada to the great grandfather of Bukhari. And his great great grandfather was Zoroastrian. So Mughira, Bukhari Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn al Mughira. Al Mughira and Yaman al Jafi. Uh, and that's why Bukhari's lineage. That says Al Jorfi. If you look at Sahih Bukhari, he'll say Al Jorfi. Why? Because his great grandfather embraced Islam at the hands of Yaman Al Jorfi, so he became Jorfi as an honorary title, Walaya, Wala. So, so that that's the connection between Musnadi and Bukhari. It's a great connection, um, you know, going back three generations. So he must have held him in great esteem. And the other thing about him is why is he called Musnadi? What does Musnad mean? So it's not it's not his name, it's not a family thing. It's some something has to do with him. Uh-huh. Related to Isnad, yeah. Musnad literally means with Isnad. But what does it mean in hadith sciences? Like in Bayquniya, who remembers Wal Musnadul Anyone remember? No one you guys did memorize it. Some of you. So Musnad is a hadith, well it's a hadith with Isnad, literally, but in sciences it means a hadith that is Muttasil and Marfu'ah. 
two things. Mutasil means it has full connection, no missing links. Marfu means it goes to the Prophet So what happened is Abu Ja'far in classes, he was only concerned with marfu hadith. He didn't care about the others. So when he was studying hadith, he would always ask, okay, give me the marfu hadith, prophetic hadith. I don't want the hadith of, you know, the athar of the companions and others. Like, so he was so insistent on that in class after class, or he would ask the question, is this hadith musnad? So he did that so much, his classmates began calling him musnad, hey, musnadi is here, musnad. Right, here's the Musnad, Musnadi. And it became his title until the end of time. And now in the books, Al Musnadi. So that just tells you, you know, where titles come from. Um, so he was among the senior teachers of Bukhari that, who also related from Bukhari, learned from Bukhari as well. As we mentioned, remember, Bukhari was so brilliant when he was learning from teachers, many of them learned from him. So he was one of those who also counted Bukhari as his teacher, although he's senior to him and Bukhari is a real student. Um, and he used to praise Bukhari himself. So Musnad, they used to say about Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail imamun, falam, faman lam yaj'alhu imaman fattahimuhu. He says, um, Muhammad ibn Ismail is the leader, is an imam. And anyone who doesn't make him an imam, you should suspect him, suspect his faith, his iman. So uh, this is how much esteem he had for him. Um, and he used to say, Hufadu zamanina thalathatun fabada abil Bukhari. He used to say, there are three great hadith experts of my time. And he would mention Bukhari first. He was number one. And Bukhari states that Hassan ibn Shajar once said to him, uh, when he realized, wait, well, you're a Musnadi student. He said, how could he have missed any hadith when he came across this treasure? Who's this treasure? Musnadi. That tells you, shows you that reciprocal relationship. Now, among the six books of hadith, it's interesting, Bukhari is the only one who has him as a teacher. So most of them were not able to meet him. Um, so Bukhari, among the six books, is the most senior of the six books. He was able to meet, meet many great and high teachers. So Musnadi himself, who are his teachers? His teachers were people like Sufyan ibn Aryana, the Muhaddith of Mecca, Fudayl ibn Ayyad, the great early Muslim, Abdul Razak al sanaani and many others. So Abu Jafar has some great teachers from the early generations. So Fudayl ibn Ayyad is a legendary person, great, early Muslim who has so many biographies written about him. Abu Jafar says, al ibn Ayyad. He said, when I said goodbye to Fudayl ibn Ayyad after learning from him, I said to him, Awsini, give me some advice. And he said to me, Kun dhamban wa la takun ra'san. So literally that means be a tail, but don't be a head. Don't be a head, be a tail. See, what do you think that means? Coming from Fudayl ibn Ayyad, the ascetic, the pious person, the one who didn't care about the dunya. Yeah, don't try to be a leader. Try to be a follower. That was his advice to him. So Abu Jafar al-Musnadi, his grading. What's his grading? Um, his status as a reporter. So al-Hakim, he says, huwa imam al-hadith fi asrihi bima wara al-nahr bila mudafa'a wa huwa ustad al-Bukhari. He was the great hadith expert of his time in Transoxania. Ma wara and nahar means beyond the sea. That's the river in Central Asia. Beyond that river is called Transoxania. So he was of that region, he was a great hadith expert. And he was a teacher of Bukhari. Uh, and the other experts, they called him, they graded him as thiqa, trustworthy. So this is the teacher of Imam al-Bukhari. He died in the year 229. Now he relates the hadith from who? Abu Amr al-Aqadi. Abu Amr al-Aqadi. So his full name was Abdul Malik ibn Amr. Abdul Malik ibn Amr al-Qaisi and his kunya was Abu Amr. Aqadi means he was from Aqada, which is a clan of the Azd tribe. So he was a hadith expert of Basra and a student of Imam Malik and a teacher of Imam Ahmad. So his 
So he was a student of Malik, teacher of Imam Ahmad, and a great hadith expert of Basra. And as far as his expertise, all the hadith experts agreed on his trustworthiness. So Nasai said he thiqa ma'moon, he is trustworthy, fully trustworthy and protected. Zahabi said about him, Kana min mashayikh al-Islam wa thiqat al-Naqala. He is from the shuyukh of Islam itself. He's from the most reliable transmitters. So as we get higher up in the chain, we're not going to do a lot of biographies because the names, we don't have as much information. We have a lot of information about the companions. We have information of the, the book, uh, Bukhari's teachers and at that generation, but in between, we just know about their grading and some brief notes about their biography. There's not a lot. So that's Abu Amr al-Aqadi. And who's his teacher? Suleiman ibn Bilal. So Suleiman ibn Bilal was from Banu Taim. So he's a Taimi of Quraysh. He was from Medina. So he was a freed slave of one of the descendants of Abu Bakr. Either Al-Qasim uh, ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr or one of his other brothers. So he was someone who related from the early, early companions. He's a Tabari. He died in the year 173. And all the experts again agreed on his trustworthiness. Imam Ahmad said about him, La ba'sa bihi thiqa, salihul hadith. Uh, he's fully trustworthy. There's no problem with him. Yahya ibn Ma'in said about him, thiqatun salihun. He is trustworthy and he's uh, salih. So Suleiman ibn Bilal is another name that comes in Isnaz. And his teacher, Abdullah ibn Dinar. So Abdullah ibn Dinar was a tabari of Medina. So now we're moving. We started in Bukhara, moved to Basra. Now we're moving to Medina. So if you study Isnad, you can trace the historical progression of these teachers. That, that tells you a lot where people are getting knowledge from. And as you get closer to the Prophet, generally you find a lot of Isnad's uh, people from Medina. So Abdullah ibn Dinar was a great tabari Medina. He was a freed slave of Abdullah ibn Umar. Freed slave of Ibn Umar. So he was someone who the majority of experts considered thiqa, fully reliable. Um, his students included Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Sufyan al-Thawri, Imam Malik, and Shorba. So Abdullah ibn Dinar al-Adawi. There's some books that make a mistake and say he's the brother of Amr ibn Dinar, another great hadith expert, who's in the hadith Rahma. But that's not the case. They're two different. They're they don't they're not. That's because of the Ibn Dinar. Some people fell into that mistake. So brother Din Aini, I was reading last night, said he's the brother of Amr bin Dinar, and I was a little surprised it was because you don't read that anywhere. You read Amr ibn Dinar's biography doesn't mention Abdullah ibn Dinar as his brother, especially someone who's a freed slave of Ibn Omar. So the more I looked into it, I um, realized uh, someone asked Imam Ahmad that, and I found a quote, are they brothers? He said, no, they're two different individuals. Um, they're not related. And then who is the next person? Abu Saleh, okay, Abu Saleh. <clears throat> So Abu Saleh died in the year 101. His full name was Zakwan Abu Saleh al-Samman al-Zayyat. So he was a senior hadith expert of Medina. He was a freed slave of Juwaidiya, Um So he, so he used to export butter and oil to Kufa. So he was a businessman, and that's why his name has al-Samman from butter and al-Zayyat from oil. So. The oil merchant, the butter merchant. So he used to go to Kufa to trade. Because of that connection to Kufa, he had great students in Kufa like Armash. That's why his name spread in that part of the world because that's where Hadith was in his time. So he learned from many senior companions, but he spent the most time with Abu Huraira and he became one of the best narrators of Abu Huraira. So Isnad of Abu Huraira, Abu Saleh was one of the strong ones. 
So he was someone who was very known to be very tender and emotional. Um, is mentioned in biography. Sometimes interesting things are mentioned, like mention something like something about having a massive beard. So when I read that, I was like, maybe I'm reading it wrong or translating it wrong. Maybe it means something else. And then the more I read, I realized no, they really meant that. The reason they mentioned that is because because he was so tender and so pious, so emotional that like whenever he would pray, he would cry so much they could see his beard moving from the back. So it was. So that's why they describe that characteristic. Um, so he was very, like, very emotional, very pious, very tender. Uh, Armash, his student from Kufa, he says that, that he used to study with him that he was the adhan of his masjid. And he said, one time I saw him um, and he gave the adhan and the imam was late. So the imam was very late, so they forced him to lead. He didn't like to lead. But he said when he was leading, he could hardly finish the prayer because he kept crying because of his tenderness and his weeping. Um, Abu Huraira says to him, Abu Huraira praised him a lot. He said to him, Ya Abu Salih, it doesn't harm you that you're not from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning that you're so pious and you're such an example that you not being from the family of the Prophet does not take anything away from you. That's how um, pious and close to Allah he was. Imam Ahmad said about him, his grading, thiqa, thiqa. Min ajlin nasi wa awthaquhum. He is from the best of people and the most trustworthy of people. And he said, thiqa, thiqa, trustworthy. He said it twice. So he was a, Abu Salih is very important to know as a narrator of Abu Huraira. And then above him is Abu Huraira. Okay, Bab Umur al Iman is done. And. Oh, it's 9.40, wow. SubhanAllah. Should we do one more hadith or stop here? Did I hear stop? Okay. All right, we did two hadith, alhamdulillah. So we'll do the next hadith next week. Any questions? I'll take questions now. Sure. Yeah, Abu Huraira student. He spent many years with Abu Huraira, freed slave of Juwayriya, Umm al the wife of the Prophet. So obviously he would be Tabari. And under him is Tabari too. So there's usually there's two, three Tabaris, like senior to junior. Yes. You can use the mic if you don't mind. Uh, did you mention the... the the, when Abdullah bin Dinar passed away? Abdullah bin what? Dinar. Abdullah bin Dinar? No. Should I mention why? I can't hear you. Uh, his death date. Oh, death date. Um, yeah, Abdullah bin Dinar is 127. 127. And Abu Amir, Al-Aqadi. Mm -hmm. Shorba. Abu Amir Al-Aqadi is 204. 204. Just yeah. add one question. Uh, mm -hmm. You said Hanzala ibn Abi Sufyan. That well, he was a grand uh, grandson of Safwan. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. Um, I'll give you the full lineage. Great grandson. Um, Hanzala ibn Abi Sufyan ibn Abdurrahman ibn Safwan ibn Umayyah ibn Khalaf. So Safwan is a Sahabi, Umayyah bin Khalaf is the enemy of the Prophet, and then Safwan had a son Abdurrahman, he had a son Abu Sufyan, and he had a son Hanzala. So three generations down. Any online questions? Alhamdulillah. Okay. Jazakumullah khair. Fatahallahu alaykum. We'll see you all next week. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum as-salamu alaykum.